Vaishnavibhyo, Vaishnavibhyo, Namo Namaha. Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Advaita Kadadhar, Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Okay, I'm sharing the screen. Can everyone see PowerPoint? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Good. We're going to begin review. Yesterday, we analyzed the progression from Karma Kanda through Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, and Jnana Yoga to Bhakti Yoga with reference to appropriate verses from Bhagavad Gita. I hope that's okay for everyone. We saw the diagram of the Yoga Ladder with the links from Karma Yoga to Bhakti Yoga. And we talked about the process of demigod worship and yagya, referring to Bhagavad Gita, chapter 3, verses 10 to 16. We're going ahead today, lesson 3. Bhakti, the ultimate yoga system. Jai, bhakti ki jai. We'll begin. Overview, chapter 4. We've been looking at some points from chapter 4. We looked about, we talked about uh, Lord Krishna's appearance and how uh, he manifests himself millennium after millennium. He appears in his original transcendental form, millennium after millennium. He can remember his births, we cannot. So that was the first section of the chapter 4, transcendental knowledge about Krishna. And then we heard about Krishna as, well if you read the chapter, Krishna is the goal of all paths and the creator of Varnashram. Certainly there's the verse there, Krishna says, Chatur Varnam Maya Shistam Guna Karma Vibhagas. Krishna said, I am the creator of the four divisions and orders of life. So Krishna is the creator of this Varnashram and ultimately all paths lead to Krishna. It's the goal of all the different paths. They're just, their path, most of the paths are all indirect. But Bhakti Yoga is a direct path. Then the chapter goes on to speak about Karma Yoga for a jnani. Karma Yoga usually Karma Yogi doesn't know very much, he doesn't have much knowledge. But a jnani, he can also do Karma Yogi, Karma Yoga. Someone with knowledge, he, he will understand that he should be active, he should do something. Rather than just be idle, rather than just sit and meditate, he should engage in activities. So that is described, verses 16 to 24 for the jnani. And then Krishna goes on to speak about sacrifices. And he speaks about how you can sacrifice material possessions, but greater than the sacrifice of material possessions. You know, you may sacrifice like your money, or you may donate some land or something like that. So that's a sacrifice of material possessions. But you can replace these things. But the greater sacrifice is the sacrifice of knowledge. It's the sacrifice of knowledge by studying the scriptures like we're doing with Bhakti Shastri, going through Bhagavad Gita. That's a, the greater sacrifice. And then Lord Krishna also explains that the ultimate sacrifice in knowledge is to approach the spiritual teacher and inquire from him. And then the chapter concludes with a summary of the effects of transcendental knowledge. 
uh, how, w oh, well, what, what kind of knowledge the spiritual master is going to give and how that knowledge can elevate us to the transcendental platform. What should, what should be the vision of one with transcendental knowledge? So like that, that's a, the, the main sections of chapter 4. Right? But we're, we're not going through all of it. Here's a section from Bhagavad Gita as it is, and the contents page. Contents. So there's a summary there to chapter 4, and we've put it here just for your attention. So transcendental knowledge, jnana yoga, as it's called in Sanskrit, and the, the Sanskrit name for the chapter is jnana yoga. So transcendental knowledge, the spiritual knowledge of the soul, of God, and their relationship. is both purifying and liberating. So the, the knowledge of the soul and of God, their relationship, is both purifying and liberating. Such knowledge is the fruit of selfless devotional action, karma yoga. Now, karma yoga is that selfless devotional action. The Lord explains the remote theory of the history, the, the remote history of the Gita, the purpose and significance of his periodic descents to the material world, and the necessity of approaching a guru, a realized teacher. So like this, he summarized the main points of the fourth chapter. The main parts being there at the beginning and then at the end. The, remote, the history of the Bhagavad Gita and the Lord's purpose and significance of his descent in the first ten verses. And then the latter part, the, the, at the end of the chapter, necessity of approaching a, a guru, a realized teacher. Going ahead, chapter 5. Chapter 5 begins with... Arjuna's question, he, Arjuna wanted to understand, was it better to act or not to act? What did Krishna want him to do? He was confused by Krishna's instruction. So Lord Krishna explains the karma yoga is better than karma sannyas. It's better to be engaged in some activity rather than to try to stop activities. An idle mind is the devil's workshop. So karma sannyas, unless one is very, unless one is very qualified to stop, the, unless he has full control over his mind and senses, will be very difficult. So better is karma yoga. Karma yoga means positive engagement, active engagement in the service of Krishna. Then, next section, Niskam Karma Yoga, or Yogi or Jnani, because chapter 5 is talking about the Jnani, actually. We heard in chapter 4, Transcendental Knowledge, so chapter 5 goes on to talk more about the Jnani and how he can also do Karma Yoga, because he, as we said, to stop, to not to, to be idle is dangerous. It's a bad example and people often get difficulties. They're not properly engaged. So even the jnani likes to do niskam karma yoga. He likes to work without any desire to enjoy the fruit. He likes to do something. And we see like that, we see Mayavadi sannyasis do things like, you know, they do, of course, they, they do mundane welfare programs. They open a children's home, or they open a hospital, or a museum, or something like that, because they're not able to be satisfied just simply engaging in meditation. They need to do something. 
So the jnani also does something, takes up karma yoga. Then the section with the relationship between Ishwara, Jiva and Prakriti. And that will be discussed again in chapter 13. Ishwara, Jiva and Prakriti, three main topics. How do they interact? The relationship between the Lord and the living entity and the material nature. It's important to understand. Next section goes on to describe the vision of a jnani or a paramatma vadi. In other words, how does he see everything? The paramatma vadi, he sees the paramatma in every living entity. You've seen that picture, uh, the, 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 the devotee is looking, he sees the elephant, the cow, the dog, the dog eater, and he sees the soul, the paramatma in all of them. So he sees them all equally. So the jnani has that kind of vision. He sees the, the, he sees the soul within all living entities. He doesn't just see the body, but he sees all living entities as souls. And then, towards the end of the chapter, speaking about dhyana yoga, and that's leading to the next chapter, leading to chapter 6. Because Lord Krishna had been speaking about meditation, and was speaking about the jnani, how he meditates on seeing the super soul. So then is the question, right, is there any other way to do meditation? So Lord Krishna explains the astanga yoga, rather than just simply doing it by the, the, as a jnani, you can do, go to astanga yoga. And then the final verse of the fifth chapter, peace formula, an important verse that we have to know how Krishna is the proprietor, he is the enjoyer, and he is our best friend. If we know those three things, then we can be peaceful. So the fifth chapter is Sanyash Yoga. Here it's called Karma Sanyash Yoga. Prabhupada calls it Karma Yoga Action in Krishna Consciousness. So from the contents, chapter 5 is summarized. Outwardly performing all actions, but inwardly renouncing their fruits, the wise man, purified by the fire of transcendental knowledge, attains peace, detachment, forbearance, spiritual vision, and bliss. Okay, so... This is the summary of chapter 5. All right, any questions on chapter 4 and chapter 5? Anyone? Hare Krishna Maharaj Ji, yes. uh, I have a question like, uh, what is the difference between Karma Yoga and Karma Sanyas Yoga? Yes, well Karma Yoga is working, doing activities. But sannyas yoga is stopping work, giving up work, not doing any work. But here, as it is written in the slide, in the heading, Karma Yoga Action in Krishna Consciousness is Karma Sanyas Yoga. So, does it mean that uh, you told in Karma Yoga also that uh, we don't desire fruit in that case, and in Karma Sanyas Yoga also? Uh, we should not desire, we should not have a desire to have a fruit while working. Means we take a sannyas from that uh, fruit. Is it like that? Generally, the karma, the, the sannyas yoga, sannyas yoga is the renounce work. Hmm. Karma sannyas, karma sannyas, they renounce work, they renounce activity. Hmm. They just want to just simply meditate. They won't do anything except meditation, absorb themselves in, trans, in their transcendental meditation. Maybe they read some scriptures, and, but a lot of time meditating, 
Maybe they chant some mantras and things. So that is karma sannyas, a yoga. Renouncing work. Of course, this fifth, the title, Karma Yoga Action in Krishna Consciousness, Prabhupada has given it this Prabhupada has given it this in this meaning. He's, he's explaining something different. So, yeah, Prabhupada's title is a bit confusing because he's talking about action in Krishna consciousness. Certainly karma yoga is action in Krishna consciousness. Okay, Maharaj, you got it. Thank you. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, I have a question. <clears throat> yes. What is the difference between karma yoga action in Krishna consciousness and uh, bhakti yoga? Because as it is mentioned in 3.29, uh, the peace formula, and it's, uh, again it talks about bhakti yoga. And how is it possible karma yoga conclusion should be? Uh, what is the difference between these two chapters, Maharaj? Well, bhakti yoga is different from karma yoga. I explained yesterday about bhakti yoga, that bhakti yoga, first we surrender. Karma yoga, we work, and then we surrender the fruit of the work. So the, the surrender comes at the end with karma yoga. Karma yoga, we're attached to working in a particular way. We work according to our position in the vana and ashrams. But bhakti yoga will do anything for Krishna. We'll do whatever Krishna wants because we surrender in the beginning and we are just simply surrendered to do whatever Krishna wants us to do. So karma yoga is different from bhakti yoga. Do you, do you understand the difference between karma yoga and bhakti yoga now? Uh, who, yeah, I understand, Maharaj. Who really can perform uh, karma yoga and who can who perform the bhakti yoga? Bhakti yoga is obviously devotees, but karma yoga action in Krishna consciousness, who well, are this category comes from? Well, His Grace Barijan Prabhu explains in his book, Surrender Unto Me, his, his commentaries on Bhagavad Gita. He said, actually, he said, most devotees are more qualified for karma yoga than for bhakti yoga. Bhakti yoga is, means hearing and chanting and remembering Krishna. Engaging like that, waking up early in the morning, going to morning program, taking part in the full program, then cooking food, offering to Krishna, like that, a full program of Krishna consciousness. That's bhakti yoga. Karma yoga is a little different. Karma yoga, you, you're working, you know, you've got maybe a job or something like that, you're going out to work, you have a family and things, and you have to do a lot of different things for the family and for the job and so on. You haven't got so much time for just hearing and chanting. But we offer some of the fruit of our work for the service of Krishna. So this is karma yoga, you see? But bhakti yoga is just simply hearing, chanting the whole day, working for Krishna the whole day. Like devotees, the full-time devotees, they will go out on sankirtan and distribute books and like that. So that's full-time bhakti yoga. But for most people, you know, they're not in that situation that they can do that. They do some bhakti, they do some bhakti, but they have to do a lot of other things. So it becomes more karma yoga rather than bhakti yoga.
You understand? Yeah. yeah thank you, Maharaj. Which one is the ultimate, uh, Maharaj, in these two categories? Well, bhakti is the top, bhakti is on the top, right? At the top of the yoga ladder is bhakti yoga. As we get older, as you get older, the family grows up and you get a bit free, you can even retire from the job, then you take up full-time bhakti yoga, right? Because we're preparing for the end of life, we're preparing for the next life. So you want to be absorbed in bhakti yoga when we leave the body and that will be good for the next life. Maybe even we can go back to Godhead. Karma yoga, karma yoga can also be impersonalists, not only devotees, but impersonalists also do karma yoga. Right? They're detached. Y yes? Uh, can you please explain bodhi yoga uh, in comparison with, with karma yoga? Buddhi yoga in comparison with karma yoga, yes, in comparison, compa compared to niskam karma yoga, right, the higher form of karma yoga, detached, where we're detached, where we're re giving the, the fruit for Krishna, the fruit of our work is going to Krishna, that would be buddhi yoga. And, but Prabhupada also will often compare buddhi yoga to bhakti yoga. It varies. Sometimes he talks about buddhi yoga as bhakti yoga and sometimes he talks about it as karma yoga. So buddhi yoga, using our intelligence to engage in service of the Lord. And we can tell, from, you know, when you read the Sanskrit verse, you will see sometimes Lord Krishna mentions Bhuti Yoga. He actually mentions it in the verse. So those particular places, the Lord is talking about Bhuti Yoga, and we, it's compared to usually Niskam Karma Yoga. But sometimes when Prabhupada is writing, Prabhupada will call all the yogas bhakti yoga. Sometimes it's karma yoga, Prabhupada will call it bhakti yoga. Because Prabhupada's emphasis is on bhakti yoga. He wants everyone to get to bhakti, to take up bhakti. So he enforces that, impresses that on everyone. Thank you very much. So you have to read the Sanskrit verse and see exactly which particular yoga is being talked about. Is it Buddhi yoga or is it karma yoga or is it bhakti yoga? Okay, we'll go ahead. Summary, chapter 4. Karma yoga and the sacrifice and, and karma yoga and sacrifice result in dhyana. So it's not just sacrifice alone, but karma yoga along with yajna or sacrifice, sacrifice either of material possessions or knowledge will result in jnana, we get jnana. And chapter 5 is the description of a jnani, the description of one with knowledge, how he's acting, what he's doing, his actions. Okay, we're going on chapter 6, which begins Yoga Rurukshore and Yoga Rutha practice. So, different levels of yoga practice they are described in the first section. Then, stages in yoga practice and samadhi. Stages in yoga practice, because we're talking about Astanga Yoga, eight stages leading to Samadhi. Then the realization of Krishna as the Super Soul, as Paramatma realization. Then we'll hear about Arjuna rejecting the Astanga Yoga process. 
And then Arjuna wants to know, what happens if I can't succeed in this practice? And Krishna describes the destination of the unsuccessful yogi. And then conclusion, the topmost yogi. All right, so we're going to look at these sections today a bit, give some time to chapter 6. So Astanga Yoga, at the bottom, Yoga Rurukshur, the beginning, we're beginning the practice of yoga, and then you have the different stages of Astanga, Yam and Niyam, Yam, the things you don't do, and Niyam, the things you do, just like in Krishna Consciousness, we have Yam and Niyam, right? No meat, no intoxication, no gambling, no illicit sex. And Niyam, what do you have to do? You have to chant Hare Krishna, chanting 16 rounds, right? So in, in Ashtanga, of course, they have different Yama and Niyam. Described in Patanjali Yoga Sutra, you can read. But similar, something similar, controlling the mind, not getting angry and being clean, these kind of things. Then asana, the sitting postures. And pranayama, the nose pressing to control the air, con controlling the air in the body. Then pratyahara, dharana, and then comes the higher level of yoga, dhyana and samadhi. So, Yoga Rudashya comes bef between dharana and dhyana. Pratyahara is becoming detached from everything external, internalizing the consciousness. Dharana, meditation. Dharana is the pre beginning of meditation, and dhyana, meditating on the super soul and leading to samadhi. So this is the Astanga Yoga. People often do asana. Asana is popular. They never do yam and niya, but they go, they like asana. They think good for health. Actually, this Astanga Yoga process is meant for meditation on the Supreme Lord to concentrate the mind. Just like chanting Hare Krishna or chanting Gayatri, it's a meditation, concentration on the Lord. So the Astanga Yoga is also a method by which we can bring our concentration onto the Lord. So Lord Krishna describes the importance of controlling the mind that we have to make the mind a friend. For one who has conquered the mind, the mind is the best of friends. And for one who has failed to do so, his very mind is the greatest enemy. A man can elevate himself by the mind, and the man can degrade himself by the mind. So very important to make, uh, to conquer over the mind. Karanam Banda Mokshayo the cause of bondage or liberation depends on us, how we use the mind. The mind, the central point of yoga practice. So Krishna, Lord Krishna brings this point out in the sixth, sixth verse. Srila Prabhupada explains. Someone please read. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Ashtanga Yoga, the purpose of practicing eightfold yoga is to control the mind in order to make it a friend in discharging the human mission. The constitutional position of the living entity is to carry out the order of the superior. As long as one's mind remains an unconquered enemy, one has to serve the dictations of lust, anger, avarice, illusion, etc. Go ahead. But when the mind is conquered, 
one voluntarily agrees to abide by the dictation of the personality of Godhead. For one who takes to Krishna consciousness directly, perfect surrender to the dictation of the Lord follows automatically. 6.6 purport. Thank you. So Prabhupada describing very clearly here how, how important it is to conquer the mind. Make the mind a friend. If the mind is not a friend, then the result is you have to serve things like lust, anger, greed, illusion, madness, envy. These different things, different qualities will all manifest in the mind. So very important that we have got this control over the mind. And this is the practice of yoga, to control the mind, to make the mind a friend. Make it a friend. Right? Sometimes described, mind is like a wild animal. And just as you train a wild animal, you have to train the mind. When you capture a wild animal, they will, they will put it in the cage and they will starve it and they will beat it and then they will feed it. And in this way the, the animal understands this man is very powerful. He's put me in the cage and he beat me and, he, and first of all he starved me and then he beat me and now he's feeding me. So I better do whatever he says. So the mind is like that. We have to beat the mind. We have to starve the mind. You have to beat the mind. Then you have to feed the mind and make it a friend. Otherwise the mind will just give us a lot of trouble. So, uh, when, the mind, when the mind is conquered, then it will surrender to Krishna. And it will do whatever Krishna says would take to Krishna consciousness. So this is the problem. When people come to Krishna consciousness, why do they go? Some people come and leave because the mind, their mind drives them, takes them out of Krishna consciousness. But if you've got the mind under control, then you'll never leave Krishna consciousness. Right? Someone please read. Krishna Yeah, go ahead. Mind is the driver. If you ask your driver, please get me to into Krishna consciousness temp temple, the driver will bring you here. And if you ask your driver, please get me into that liquor house, the driver will drive you there. The driver's business is to drive you wherever you like. Yeah. Similarly, your mind is the driver. If you lose control, then wherever he likes, he will take you. Then you're gone. Then your driver is your enemy. But if your driver acts on your order, then he's your friend. Bhagavad Gita 6.25. Right. So where is the mind in this picture? The one who's um, riding on the chariot. No. Oh, the horses, <laughs> sorry. The horses are the senses. The horses. The reins. Yes, the reins are the mind, right? The horses are the senses, and the reins are the mind, and the driver is... Who's the driver? Intelligence. Intelligence, right? And the passenger is... Soul. The soul. And the chariot is? The body. Yeah, body. right. Like that. So there's relationship between the mind and the intelligence and the senses. So we have to use our intelligence. And where do we, we get intelligence? And the, the soul is there giving instruction to the driver, telling the driver where to go. But sometimes the driver doesn't listen <laughs> or maybe the horses are very wild and uncontrollable and they don't like to listen. So driver 
uh, Prabhupada says, uh, if you lose control, then wherever he likes, he will take you. Then you are gone. Then your driver is your enemy. But if your driver acts on your order, then he's your friend. So you need to have a good driver, good intelligence to control the mind and senses. That's important. And we get that intelligence by proper sadhana, by hearing and chanting. Lord Krishna gives the direction because Lord Krishna is seated next to the soul, next to the individual living entity. From the super soul comes knowledge, remembrance and forgetfulness. So as the super soul, Lord Krishna can understand what is our desire and he's directing us accordingly. So the idea anyway, conquer, control the mind. Okay, here's a little exercise for you. Read six, chapter 6 verses 33 and 34 and discuss in pairs, some of you are already in pairs, how practical is Astanga Yoga for the modern age? Okay. Just read over those two verses and think about how practical is this Astanga Yoga for today. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, how many groups are to be divided? Well, some people are already in pairs. Uh, those who, you know, let other people, they have to, you have to, if you can get a partner, it's good. If some, okay. Can you arrange that? So, uh, so we need to break up the rooms or like uh, we can go like this only? I think we can just go like this only. Okay, okay, my much. Saki Hairani Mataji, you can uh, discuss with them Archana Mataji, right? And Bhavana uh, Mataji can uh, do with Bharat Prabhu. Kuhan Prabhu can do with uh, Kirtida Mataji. Uh, and uh, Apara Gandharvika Mataji can do with uh, Jeevan Prabhu, Jeevan Bilava Prabhu. And uh, Amrita Gopi Mataji both. Oh, sorry. Apara uh, and um, Gandharvika Mataji can do with Jeevan Bilva Prabhu and Amrita Gopi Mataji can do with Jayanti Govinda Prabhu. And Parsati Mohan Prabhu you can do with uh, maybe you can join uh, Amrita Gopi Mataji. How do we discuss because we're not in a breakout room? Hare Krishna Yagna Prabhu, are you going to break down the groups?
I think it is not possible to put uh, in groups. Other people will also get the uh, request and they will not be able to join. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, can everyone hear me? Yes, Madam. Yes, Madam. Yes, Okay. So I think you've all had enough time to read these two verses. So does anyone feel that practicing Ashtanga Yoga is actually practical in this modern age? No word. Okay, so what, what are the reasons, the main reasons why it's not practical? Short duration of... Go ahead, ma'am. All right, Mataji said short duration of life. That could be one reason, yes. How long did uh, Kardama Muni practice Astanga Yoga for? In Srimad Bhagavatam, Kardama Muni is the husband, you know, he became, he got married to Devahoti, who was the daughter of Swayam Bhuvamanu. So Kardama Muni had been a yogi and he was doing Astanga Yoga for I think 10,000 years and then after that, then he got married after 10,000 years of practice of Astanga Yoga, then he married Devahuti. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. And uh, another reason is that uh, 
in the, this age of Kali, people are not serious about um, um, the self-realization. Yes. So they won't Sorry. even they won't even think of doing Ashtanga Yoga then. Yeah, and uh, Maharaj Ashtanga Yoga, which regulates the mode of living, the manner of sitting, and the, also the important thing is, in is selection of place and detachment from the material engagements also, in one sense. So, what's the mode of sitting? The mode of sitting, the mode of sitting is one should not sit, um, not so high, uh, not uh, not low on the floor, and then. Uh, well, that doesn't sound very difficult. Yeah, but that could be possible, the, but the selection of the place is also very difficult, Maharaj, because one has to go to secular places, or uh, for example to Himalayas, where there is. Uh, um, the atmosphere is more favorable for perform the Ashtanga Yoga. So some people must may like quiet places, they like to go to the mountain, they like to be there on their own, sit there. Is it very difficult? What's so difficult about it? And also Maharaj, um, because the mind is so restless, Mind is not controlled, so restless that they can't sit. We can sit in that one place for quite a long time to meditate. Right. How long do they have to sit? For a very long time, Maharaj, thousands of years. Yeah. The, actually, the, it's not just go there for two hours and, and you know, or sit down. Like people do the meditation nowadays, they draw the curtains in their home, make everything quiet and sit down and meditate. Now I'm meditating. Not like that. You know, that's pretending to do Astanga Yoga. That's not actually Astanga Yoga. They're pretending to meditate. What they have to do really, is go out from the house. Go out from the house and, as you say, for a long time. And they have to go and they have to sit very straight and very still. Sit very straight. One time we had this one, uh, one devotee, one man, well, he became a devotee. Initially he was not a devotee. He was a yogi. <laughs> he, and he, he was very adept yogi, very good yogi. He was an astanga yogi. And he came, he met devotees, devotees in the airport were distributing books and he got a book and he was interested and he came and met the devotees and he saw the devotees, he said, he said, you know, you people don't sit very well, you don't sit properly, you're all bent over. <laughs> and he saw that how the devotees sit and he could understand why they couldn't chant japa properly. Because they were all bent, the back, the back was bent, they were not sitting properly. So he, he said, it's not surprising you go to sleep when you chant your japa. You bend your head, you put your head down, bend the back, you're going to go to sleep. He said, you have to learn to sit properly like a yogi. So they said to him, why don't you join? You can teach us. And so he did. As so I became a devotee, and <laughs> he taught. And for a while he was a devotee and he taught devotees, he did some nice preaching also. And eventually he went back to his yoga, but uh, he did do some service on behalf of Krishna. But it, it was a good point, practical point, you know. And it's also there in the Bhagavatam, Jiva Goswami mentions in one, uh, Prabhupada quotes Jiva Goswami in one purport, that we have to sit straight, we have to sit properly. These are Astanga Yoga is, requires like that, a pretty, in Astanga Yoga there's a discipline. And we should also do it, we should be able, to, if we sit properly we won't go to sleep. And you'll hear Prabhupada talking sometimes when he's chanting Japa, he will say, sit properly. 
sit properly. Why? Because sometimes the devotees would put their arms around their knees, you know, wrap their arms around the legs. And you're not supposed to do like that. You're supposed to sit. As you can see in the picture, you can see the yogi sitting there, the knees are on the ground and like that. You're not supposed to have the knees up and the arms wrapped around the legs. That's not proper. And Prabhupada said, will say, sit properly. <laughs> so he was training all of us how to sit. So in Astanga Yoga, we see nowadays, who can do it? When people come to the temple, they can't even sit on the, they can't even sit. They need a chair. They have to have chairs to sit in. They can't sit on the floor. They can't sit cross-legged. And so, very difficult for most people. Some few people, some few people can do it. And Prabhupada also recognizes that, that for some people, may be possible, but for the mass of people, not possible. Okay. Any Krishna, other? Yes? I have a question. So, we read about Hiranak Kashipu, he performed so many years of austerity. Is that also counted as some sort of like, you know, yoga or because he was also, what was he meditating on or because he did not believe in Supreme Lord. So is that also counted as one of these uh, yoga process, like, you know? Well, uh, we, we will read that austerities can also be in the mode of ignorance. You have to consider what, what was the purpose behind his austerities. So the Haranya Kashipu, yes, he did great austerities. He went to a mountain place and he was doing austerity, standing on his tiptoes, arms up in the air, and the insects came and they had all the flesh off his body, but still he continued. And his whole body was covered by an anthill, but still he, somehow he was able to keep the life air there. So that's austerity in the mode of ignorance, which damages the body, and austerity for some purpose, which is to give harm to others. This is all the mode of ignorance. So whether it's yoga or not, I mean, well, yoga means to link with the Supreme. So he, Harani Kashipu, he's not linking with the Supreme. He was connecting, he, he was worshipping Brahma. He wanted to get the benedictions from Lord Brahma. And so, although he's doing these austerities, it's not yoga. All right? Any other comments and questions on this? Uh, yes, Lord, I wanted to ask, how about uh, Drupa Maharaj Maharaj Agudev? He uh, was doing the kind of tapasha, but it, that is uh, devotion service, or, but he gets success very fast, like only six months. Well, Dhruva Maharaj got his instruction from Narada Muni. So whatever Dhruva Maharaj was doing was based on the, the instructions he'd taken from Narada Muni. So Narada Muni gave him mantra to chant, he's chanting Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya and he was controlling his eating and controlled, eventually he started to control his breathing and he was, his, his concentration was so intense that it created a disturbance in the universe that everybody became, began to suffocate on account of Dhruva Maharaj's austerities. So was that yoga, as Dhruva Maharaj was doing? Well, he was doing meditation. He was concentrating on, on the Supreme Lord. He wanted to see the Lord. He wanted to get a benediction from the Lord. He wanted a kingdom. So he got it. The Lord came, gave him. So uh, it's not usually considered yoga, but you know, he was chanting mantras and he was controlling his, 
he wasn't. Is it, I don't think it's directly Astanga yoga that he was doing, but he did very severe austerities, controlling eating, and then stopping eating, then drinking only a little, then not even drinking, then controlling his breathing. And so there's some progression there in the austerities, and his purpose purpose was to get something material. Uh, and one more question, Guru. So meditation process is not at all recommended for the devotees, right Guru Maharaj? Sometimes we as a devotee also we feel like our mind is so restless. Even when we chant, there's so many thoughts coming. So can we uh, practice like, you know, just uh, like normal meditation, but maybe we think of Krishna or something like that, but just quiet. Can can we do that or? Well, well, if you cannot control your mind when you're chanting, you'll never control your mind when you sit quiet. Controlling the mind when you're chanting is much easier than controlling your mind when you sit quietly. You may sit quietly, your mind will be all over the place. You'll never control your mind. But if you, if you do the chanting, you, one thing you should do, you should try to chant a little louder so that you can focus more on the holy name. So loud chanting is more helpful to control the mind. But silent chanting or meditating and just sitting silently, that's very difficult. That's the most difficult. But concentration on the sound vibration is much more easier, much more recommended than silent meditation. Silent meditation, you have to be very, very powerful. You have to have very strong control over your mind because the mind will wander very quickly. So Prabhupada did, didn't recommend… Yes? I have a question. Yes. Oh, what about, there's some yogis, so far we've been discussing uh, about those who are meditating, meditating upon the Lord. What about those who don't meditate on nothing? How do you describe them? They meditate on nothing. On the void. Try to make the mind void. Yes, that's... What kind of yoga system is that? Well, that's what we call sunyavadi, right? Make them the voidists, they're voidists. <laughs> Make the mind blank. Yeah, some people try to, because they say ultimately nothing is real. Uh, we should just, we shouldn't think of anything. But how long can they do that? They can't do that for very long make the mind void, make the mind empty, and then immediately something will come in the mind. Immediately. Prabhupada gives the example, just like you have a glass. If the glass is empty, immediately something will come in, dirt, dust, something, some pollution, something will come inside the glass. But if the glass is full, then nothing can enter. So Prabhupada said, you keep the mind full with thought of Krishna, then nothing can come in the mind. We have to think of Krishna, we have to be able to think of Krishna. Then if we have our mind full of thought of Krishna, there's no room to think of anything else. But if you try to make the mind blank, then certainly things are going to come in the mind. Because it's the nature of the mind to desire. You cannot stop the mind, but we can purify. So we have to purify the mind, purify the desire. And that means desire in Krishna consciousness. That will keep the mind under, keep the mind in a good condition, make the mind a friend. Desire for Krishna, Krishna's service. But if you don't think of Krishna, then you'll think of Maya, because it's the nature of the mind. 
even when we sleep at night, so many dreams are there, so many thoughts come in the mind. You cannot stop the mind for, very, for any length of time. It's artificial. But we can purify the mind by Krishna consciousness. So that's the point. Understand? Yes, Maharaj. Thank you very much. Okay, well, go ahead. Let's see. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Uh, about the austerity, you just mentioned that it can be counted as a mode of ignorance. Yes. And But isn't austerity helpful in practicing Krishna consciousness? Well, there's austerity in goodness, there's austerity in passion, and austerity in ignorance. Oh, I see. I thought only in ignorance. Yeah. So austerity in goodness is doing things like, you know, practicing Krishna consciousness. Wake up early in the morning, chant Hare Krishna. It's austerity. Go out and, and go out and distribute books. That's an austerity in Krishna consciousness. And fasting on a courtesy. It's an austerity. Fasting on the holy days, like Nishinga Chaturdasi. It's an austerity, but it's in the mode of goodness. You get purification. Yes, my Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj Ji. Uh, yes. As you explained in uh, Ashtang Yoga, there are two things, Yoga Rurukshad and Yoga Rudhasya. So, what's the actual meaning of that, Yoga Rurukshad and Yoga Rudhasya? Uh-huh. So, so, let's go back. Yoga Rurukshar, this is the preliminary stage, the beginning of yoga. Okay. And the Yoga Rudashya is where you're coming to perfection. Okay. Okay, fine, Prabhuji, got it. Thank you. Where you're coming to contemplate the Supreme Lord. But the Yoga Rurukshar is just the initial stage, coming to begin the yoga process. So you can see the, uh, the astan, what's there, the yam and niyam, the rules and regulation, the asana, sitting, breath control, then pratyahara, detachment, okay? So, uh, so, Astanga Yoga, described here, text number 10, point is made, alone, you do the meditation alone, you don't go with someone, you go alone, you're going to meditate, you're not going to talk, so you go alone, you don't need somebody with you, you're going alone, you don't even take your mobile phone, just take your deer skin, and you go there, to the mountain or cave or somewhere. We see in Srimad Bhagavatam, some of the great yogis, they would go into the sea and they would sit in the bottom of the ocean and do their meditation. So Bari Muni was in the bottom of the Yamuna and the uh, Prachetas, they were meditating in the bottom of the sea. Anyway, go alone. Then, text 11 and 12 describe Shucho Deshe, not in the city. You have to go out of the city, you have to go to the remote place, right? People like to pretend they're meditating. <laughs> they're in their house, they didn't give up anything, they didn't go anywhere, they just sat down in their house, oh I'm meditating. And Kai lagna kushotaram, kushotaram, kusha grass. You should have the kusha grass to sit on, as well as the deer skin and cloth, soft cloth, the deer skin. And then darayam achalam stira, hold, hold still. Yeah, yeah. We have to sit perfectly still, 
straight and still, not moving. It's not easy. Uh, people have told me, I knew that this one devotee who was a yogi, he was doing the, the yoga, he was studying Astanga yoga with one of the very famous teachers. He died, the teacher died a few years ago, Pratapi Joyce. So he's, he was a very prominent Astanga yoga teacher. So this, devo this one devotee from America, he went there and he studied Astanga yoga from him. And he, he told me, I said, you have to, you, my legs used to ache so much because just sitting, sitting the, practically the whole day, sitting the whole day in one position to do Astanga yoga, to do this breath control, to sit still, very difficult. Who can do it? And then Vigata B, devoid of fear, although you're alone and you're in a remote place, and you'll be there in the night also, you're not afraid, you'll tolerate. And brahmachari vrat, celibacy. This is, these are all important items in the practice of Astanga Yoga. Bhakti Yoga, you don't have to be brahmachari. Bhakti Yoga, you can be a grihasta, it's okay. But Astanga Yoga, you should be a brahmachari, celibacy, no association with the opposite sex. And for the women also, women are also going to do astanga yoga, they also have to be celibate, prasanta, unagitated, peaceful, machita, concentrate on Krishna, very nice. And then nirvana paramam. Nirvana, stop all material existence. No more birth and death, right? This is the supreme nirvana. Nirvana. The Buddhists talk about that. Nirvana. So, the Astanga yogi, he wants to finish up his material existence by practice of yoga. Not very easy thing. As we said, takes a very long time, progress very slowly. Yukta, meaning regulated. Yukta vairagya, regulated renunciation. It should be regulated. So text number 28 describes Sukena Brahma samsparsham atyantam sukham ashnate, being in constant touch with the Supreme attains the highest happiness. So we want happiness. This is happiness. This is the highest happiness. Get in touch with the Super Soul, with the Lord in the heart. Right? You can do it by Astanga Yoga. Prabhupada explains. Who would like to read? Prabhu, let's have a Prabhu read. Hare Krishna Maharaj, I will read it. Astanga Yoga, just imagine what is his qualification. He is direct friend of Krishna and he is a great warrior. He has got administrative capacity and at the same time his knowledge. Comparing his knowledge, this Bhagavad Gita, he understood within one hour. This Bhagavad Gita, which is not understood in one life at the present moment, he understood this Bhagavad Gita in one hour. So how much intelligent he was and he belonged to the royal family. All facilities were there. He is accepting that it is not possible for me. Do you think what was impossible for Arjuna 5000 years before in such favorable circumstances? Is it possible for you? Do you belong to Arjuna category? No, we are thousand times lower than Arjuna's category. And what was impossible for Arjuna, do you think it is possible for you? Bhagavad Gita 632 40, New York, September 14, 1966. 
Can you tell us, Prabhu, what were these favourable circumstances which Arjuna had? Arjuna has uh, favourable circumstances as Lord Krishna was his friend. Yes. Um, and then other thing was, um, he was a great warrior. In one sense, he has all the facilities, material facilities spoken. Yes. Then. Uh, yes, very good. He was a great warrior and he had Lord Krishna as a friend. He was a son of Indra, right? Yeah. Born in the womb of Kunti. So, so many good things, so many wonderful qualities. But still, Arjuna said, I can't do it, not possible for me. But still people think, oh, I can do it, that's possible for me. <laughs> so, some, it's actually quite foolish of people to think they can do it. So many requirements are there. <clears throat> of course, people, they like to do the they like to do more the asana and sometimes pranayama, but the rest of it, no, they don't care. Even the yama and niyam are forgotten. What does, nobody ever goes on to the pratyahara, dharana, dhyana and samadhi. Although you do get some people, they do dhyana, they do meditation, they begin the meditation, they're doing meditation, they practice dhyana yoga, but they, they never did any of the other stuff, nothing. <laughs> and what? And as you say, they're meditating on something, medit try to meditate on the void. It's a joke. How can they meditate on something void? Meditate on nothing? Impossible. You can't do it. And pra to practice all of these things, to be alone, no. Brahmachari? No. Machita? Concentrate on Krishna? No. Sit still? No. <laughs> not, it's a, not, not, it, it, really, they just pretend. They're very good pretenders, imitators. And often people, they, they say, I'm meditating, they just go to sleep. They just go to sleep and then they say, oh, I had a nice meditation. Everybody knows they were just sleeping. So in this age, this process of Astanga Yoga, very difficult. So, Sorry, Krishna Maharaj. Yeah. But yes. Sometimes, as devotee, you meet with people who just read about these things. They don't practice Astanga Yoga. They don't quite understand. But they are comparing this with devotional service, and they are thinking. That the devotional service is very easy to chant Hare Krishna and perform devotional service is very easy. Therefore, the end result cannot be as good as practicing one of this yoga system because the difficulty. And now that we are discussing it, we are seeing how difficult it is actually. It is practically impossible uh, to do this, to do this Astanga Yoga. So they would often compare it and they will think that devotional service. Is easy, but actually, in our practical experience, devotional service to control the mind and chant all the time and engage in all the activities you have to do and still fully engage your mind in Krishna is not actually easy to when you can consider it. So, can we say, you know, uh, this is actually to aspire for something that is difficult and, and impossible in this age is considered to be like in the mode of ignorance? Well, but Prabhupada did say, for some people, for some people it's possible. So we have to look at the sincerity of the purpose. The, pe the people who are trying to do it, what is their intention, what is their motivation in trying to do this process? Are they doing it just to be different, just to get attention from others? just to be recognized, 
Or do they have really the genuine desire to actually realize the super soul? So you, you cannot just simply judge by the activity. We have to look at the consciousness, the, the motivation. Then we can understand. I mean, we do find people coming to bhakti yoga and they're not very serious sometimes. They don't practice very, they don't take it very seriously. And people also say bhakti yoga process is not so easy. You, we may say it's very, compared to astanga yoga is very easy, but still it's not so easy to get people to do the things, to chant 16 rounds, to sit for two, at least two hours, or don't have to sit, but at least to chant for two hours every day and to absorb themselves in the chanting of the Holy Name. For some people it's very difficult. And to get people to be vegetarian sometimes is very difficult. They can't give up their bad habits. So bhakti yoga, although we say, yeah, oh, it's, it's very easy, yeah, in some ways it's easy, but to actually do it, to actually do it properly, uh, as we heard, we should think of Krishna, remember Krishna constantly, with devotion, with love, not very easy. We have so many attachments, so many desires in the mind. It's difficult to control the mind. Bhakti yogi also has to control the mind. Right? That's right. So the Stanga yogi, he's, you know, he's going to practice alone. We don't practice bhakti yoga alone. We like to do it with devotees. In fact, we're encouraged not to do it on our own. But with, with devotees, it's much easier and much more joyful in the association of devotees. So Astanga Yoga is more of a, you know, you're going into isolation, you're going away from the world. People have to be trained, of course, to, they have to be qualified to be able to do that. They should know what they're doing and how to practice. It's not a small thing. But Prabhupada explains that in previous ages everyone knew how to control the life air and how to practice pranayama and how to meditate, how to concentrate the mind. Everyone knew how to do these things. In Kali Yuga, nobody knows hardly. But in previous ages, everybody knew. All right? So Bhakti Yoga is at the top of the yoga ladder. The Jnana Yogi may go to the impersonal Brahman. He may be a Brahma Jnani. He may be an impersonalist. Others, they may go from Jnana Yoga to jnana yoga, to meditation, they realize the super soul, and then they take up bhakti yoga and do service for Krishna. Okay, here's an important point. Bhakti yoga contains all the components of the other yoga systems. For example, karma yoga, the element is detachment. Is a devotee practicing bhakti yoga detached? Do we have detachment in practice of bhakti yoga? What do you say? Yes, Maharaj. Yes. Detachment from material desires. Really? And you, their results. You're detached from material desires? Yeah, we should we should be attached to Krishna. Right? That's our detached. De if we're attached to Krishna, then we're really detached from material desires. If, we have, if we're not attached to Krishna, then we're still attached to material desires. Then Jnana Yoga, 
knowledge. What about in bhakti yoga? Do we have knowledge? Yes, Maharaj, transcendental knowledge. Transcendental knowledge. Knowledge of Krishna's energies. All right? Krishna's energy. We know about Krishna. Krishna's incarnations, Krishna's in appearances, Krishna's energy, how he creates and how he annihilates the universe. And different ways that the Lord manifests his potencies. Knowledge of our relationship with Krishna. And then, what about sense and mind control, dhyana yoga? How does that apply to the devotee? By using our senses and mind for the service of Lord Krishna. Uh, how do we do that? By doing deity worship uh, and other service, like chanting is also a service for Lord Krishna by chanting the holy name and reading the scriptures. Right. And telling about Krishna to other people also. Right. Chanting the holy name, japa, remembering Krishna, service to Krishna. We want to remember Krishna, we have to first hear and chant. If we have not heard, if we have not done a lot of hearing and chanting, we won't be able to remember Krishna. People complain, I'm not able to remember Krishna. The problem is you didn't do enough hearing and chanting. The more you put, the more you do hearing and chanting, then remembrance of Krishna will come naturally. That's the fact. All right, a little exercise for you. Perform a role play showing how bhakti yoga contains all the components of the other yoga systems. How many people have we got? Yagna? Yagna Prabhu? Yes, yes Maharaj. How many people are here today in the class? It's uh, 15, Maharaj. 15. Okay, so can we have uh, three groups of five? Okay, Maharaj. We want we want to see you show how bhakti yoga contains all these components. Right? The components are here. Uh, shall I open the rooms, Maharaj, now? Yes. Hare Krishna to everyone. So we have to do a role play in regards to how what you want. Encompasses all the other yogas, right? Yeah, yes, bro. Karma yoga, Nani yoga, Nani yoga. Marge, give us a, a, a little screen there just now so we can even go over that. Karma, Gyana, Gyana yoga. So, anybody have an idea of how we're going to role play this? Anybody? We can distribute uh, these uh, three types of yoga in uh, everyone can get a chance to speak about that. Means it's a role play, so everyone will describe that how karm yoga can be converted to bhakti yoga. Means how in bhakti yoga karm yoga comes 
So first of all, we'll explain that uh, what's the real meaning of yoga, that is to get connection with Krishna. So in case of karma yoga, how can we, uh, it, it is a part of bhakti yoga. Means if we, uh, like uh, Maharaji has said that in karma yoga, we have to get attached and attached to Krishna. So if we do that, then uh, in that form, uh, it will become a bhakti. So it will be a part of bhakti yoga, karma yoga. And similarly, in case of Gyan Yog, uh, Yoga, uh, we can use, uh, we can have the transcendental knowledge of Lord Krishna by reading scriptures. So, in that form, we'll, it will become a part of Bhakti Yoga. In our relationship with Krishna also. Understand mm-hmm. Krishna's energy in our relationship with Yeah, yes, my energy. And the annual finally. Others can also share their thoughts on this. Hare Krishna Prabhu, for Jnana Yoga, I think we can use chanting as well. You know, it's also uh, partly meditating on the Lord's holy name. So maybe we can yes. use uh, chanting of the holy name, yes. That's Dhyana Yoga as well, included. Yeah, remember Krishna. Yes, yes, Prabhu. Practically, all these things you can use chanting. How would you look at them? Basically, you can cover most of it. But I think it's more relevant to use it for the meditating because we'll have to focus on the name of Krishna while we are chanting and to hear. So it is extremely focusing on the name of the Lord. How are we going to do role play? I just don't understand. How are we going to represent in a role play? That's what I'm trying to do. That's what I'm trying to do. Maybe we can do it in a conversation. Someone initiated a topic that Bhakti Yoga encompasses of the different yoga system. Uh, yes, bro, we can do it. And we can uh, do it in like, like you can just keep asking questions. So. Yeah, I think who are you and Raman Narsin Prabhu can do it. It's nice if you, it's a conversation. I think it's a good thing. I'm thinking you and Bhavana Mataji and Puan Prabhu. <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, Bhavana Mataji, you could you could you could start with you and go on for can speak on the Yoga. You can do that. Okay. Okay. Uh, we can take the person who hasn't speak uh, right till now, so he will get a chance. You know, she will get a chance to speak. I think Kuhan Prabhu, I have. I mean, personally, I didn't hear from. Him. So, not so much. Oh, Kuman Prabhu has been representing all the groups the last couple of weeks. <laughs> okay. I've been representing the group for all the last couple of weeks. I, will, I enjoy hearing from him. Jai Govinda Prabhu, we should hear from you this time. Yeah, I think Kuhan Prabhu and Bhavna Mataji, as you mentioned, is. to the knowledge of Krishna energy and now you say uh, you are full of knowledge and that and that that is how you know knowledge is the in 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 itself there is nothing beyond knowledge because respect to yogi tries to show that if I'm a karma yogi I'll say nothing beyond karma yogi karma yogi okay. is the highest order so that way okay. you can actually in the arguments okay okay so i will say my knowledge is the supreme
Um, and like uh, that's my, um, what you know, these days everybody's in, in front of computer and the internet. Um, people, you know, generally watch movies or you know, any sort of uh, entertainment in YouTube. Mm. Um, but about, you know, when we're in Krishna consciousness and bhakti, practicing bhakti yoga instead of watching all sorts of movies and news in YouTube, but we can watch, we watch, you know, Krishna Katha or some uh, lecture from, you know, devotee, Prabhupada, mm -hmm. you know, some, yeah. something that, yeah, something that we, we do the same thing, but we're just um, doing different that help us elevate in Bhakti Yoga. Okay. So that also will come for Karma Yoga, right? Much Karma Yoga, basically. Yeah. Oh, I was thinking of the Dhyana Yoga, the English sense is in service to Krishna. Yeah. I don't know if that's going to be a good one for that part. Okay. Dhyana Yoga, basically, we actually uh, control the senses and mind. That is Dhyana Yoga. But in Krishna Conscious itself, how we are incorporating Dhyana Yoga is like... Uh, um, we engage our senses and mind. Uh, so by doing those activities, we oh, are able to focus on Krishna. We are able to uh, see the, by dressing the deities, we are able to actually uh, uh, think about which will look nice on Radharani or how okay. we can dress the deities like that. Okay. And like that. So, so basically engaging or focusing our mind and senses. Earlier, uh, it was on blank, like keeping the mind still or something like that, that is not going to be possible. So, but now we are focusing on Krishna. So, yeah. so like that. So, um, Bharat Prabhu, like we can take two, two at a time, like um, Bhakti Yoga and Karma Yoga, um, like how Mataji was saying for the first Karma Yoga, how uh, earlier we or Amrita Mataji because you were given this example we can say like how uh, you were earlier uh, okay we were we were going and uh, then now uh, you can uh, say right. that yeah. right that okay one. yeah Bharat Prabhu you can take up this knowledge this Jnana yeah. yes, Yoga Mataji. yes Mataji yes okay and Kashyapa Muni Jnana Yoga is okay for you Prabhu Kashyapa Muni Prabhu Prabhu and Mataji I'm still not able to unmute. Okay. Okay, so Dhyana Yoga, I will I will try to uh okay. Yagna. Maharaj, you are muted. Oh. Yagna Prabhu, uh, can, can we close the rooms? Yes, yes, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Everyone back in now? No, Maharaj. Actually, it'll take 15 seconds now. Oh, okay. Yeah. A bit more time. Yeah. Okay, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Hare Krishna. Everyone back. All right. So, 
Can we start with maybe what group number three? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, uh, Amrita Mataji and Bharat Prabhu, you can start. Yes. Yeah. Bharat Prabhu, I would you like to go ahead first? Yes, yes, Mother. Mataji, go ahead. Okay. Um, Hare Krishna Maharaj, um, I'm going to share some of my experience about this karma yoga detachment and attachment to krishna um, before coming to krishna consciousness um, i was really so much into uh, i mean uh, engaged so many to the engagement of my material senses material um engagement and um, um, i used to spend so much time and energy and money uh, just serving my serving my body, just decorating my body, serving my senses, just going for shopping. I used to buy whatever, I used to buy everything, whatever come across my eyes, just look beautiful. I used to buy even though they are not, um, I was never gonna need them. And after coming to Krishna consciousness, um, I gradually, with the association of devotees and listening uh, Prabhupada's and senior devotees lectures and reading uh, some of Prabhupada's books, I slowly began to understand that I was just simply wasting my time, money and energy and just going for shopping, all sorts of, you know, just decorating my bodies, filling my material senses. Uh, I came to realize that and now I have slowly, I started regulating, I went down slowly, gradually, and now it's been nearly four years that I have not set my foot inside the mall, shopping mall. So. I have not really bought anything for myself. So my husband um, can't believe his eyes and he can't believe his ears. He, he just tells me, I can't believe you're the same person. So I can't believe myself either, but it's just Krishna's Kripa and then, you know, devotees mercy that it's just, that's what I have been. And then I, I like the, the detachment, I just started, um, and then I have de developed my attachment to Krishna. And uh, sometimes I buy things, if I feel inclined to buy, go for shopping, then I buy things for Radharani and then buy things for my deities. Okay, very nice, yeah. So that's your detachment, your atta right. attachment to Krishna. You, you detached yes, yes, yourself. Nice from material desires and attach, by attaching yourself to Krishna. Yes, Maharaj. Very nice. Thank you. All right. What about Jnana Yoga? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj I am going to speak on Jnana Yoga. Like uh, before coming to Krishna Consciousness, I used to rise in the morning, switch on the TV, uh, seeing the news, what is the latest news, what is happening everywhere. And then after that, reading the newspaper, not even satisfied with the TV news then uh, seeing the mundane books, reading the magazines, all day passing in uh, material activity. But once when I got attached to the Krishna Questionless activity, I started going to the temple in the Mangla Arti, rising early in the morning, uh, and attending the uh, Mangla Arti at 4 a.m., 4 to 30 a.m., and associating with the devotees, performing uh, Tulsi Arti, and serving the devotees. Uh, and Instead of now watching TV, I used to watch the Hare Krishna TV with uh, all the um, things associated with devotees, how they celebrate the functions like the Mashmi, uh, Radha Ashmi, <coughs> and Gaur Purnima. And instead of using the magazine, like I started using the magazine of Back to God and magazine published by Prabhu Paji, I have the articles, good articles, and also discussing the same with uh, my neighbors and my friends. As early I used to discuss the news, the group, uh, like what is the latest uh, agenda going on. Now we used to discuss on the Krishna, what is the latest, uh, means how can we improve on the Krishna consciousness. Hmm. And also I was fond of watching cricket also. Now I have no interest in cricket. Uh, instead that I used to engage more in Krishna consciousness and want to know more about that. How can I improve myself and how can I improve others also in Krishna consciousness? And also reading Bhagavad Gita on the daily basis. 
so that's how how i improve myself and also trying to improve others um, for a gyan yoga okay so you purified your gyan it's time to have you read all Prabhupada's books? Um, most of them I have read, but uh, not gone to that extent in mind, not capture the the, uh, the thing that we need to capture it. Trying to slowly, gradually, I'm improving myself. Okay. Okay, so what about Dhyana Yoga? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, basically, before coming, to, before coming into Krishna Consciousness, uh, uh, I have uh, I have tried uh, a few organization where they teach meditation and uh, uh, probably vipassana meditation and uh, the Chidmya mission um, school also. So uh, there actually uh, for half an hour also, if we sit still and if we try to meditate uh, at the end of uh, by the end of half an hour, I think we would have got a good sleep. So um, uh, not able to keep the mind still or you go into uh, sleep. But after coming into Krishna consciousness, uh, uh, we are able to nicely engage our senses and mind uh, in actually uh, Krishna conscious activities in the service of uh, Krishna's activities. And uh, we are actually able to uh, feel the bliss. Uh, basically all our senses, our mind, everything is engaged. And uh, we are all, always focusing on the Lord, uh, always thinking like how we can please the Lord in all aspects. Like, okay, today this service is there, tomorrow that service is there, any festival comes, what is the service we can take to actually uh, please the Lord? So uh, uh, so our mind is engrossed in uh, uh, serving and pleasing the Lord. So uh, this way, uh, we our mind is not thinking about material things or our mind is not disturbed. And we are actually able to... Um, serve the Lord uh, very happily by engaging our mind and senses in Krishna Consciousness. Okay, so by Krishna Consciousness your meditation becomes more uh, prolonged, right? You, could, you know, your half-hour meditation in the other field, you, you're only doing yes. meditation for half an hour, but in Krishna Consciousness your meditation can be the whole day. Yes, yes, Maharaj, and especially during festival times, it actually, uh, you know, from the time of planning a festival and uh, meditating and praying to the Lord, praying to the spiritual master and Prabhupada, how we are going to organize this festival. And so it's, it's, it's a big uh, thing. And uh, finally, the gratitude we have uh, to, to uh, our Acharyas and uh, Prabhupada and uh, um, uh, to Krishna saying, I mean, after everything is going well, so we feel very, very happy and satisfied at the uh, Finally. Okay, very nice. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Alright, let's go ahead to group number one. Hare Krishna, everyone. Yes. What we'll be doing, you'll be having a conversation between uh, everyone in the group will be participating. Okay. So I'll start with okay. asking a question, but then we'll, have a, we'll be having some response. So, Hare Krishna, guys. Tell me something. I've, I've seen, very special. I've seen that in this Vedic culture, or even when you go through Bhagavad Gita, there is so much different yogic uh, ideas, or there is so much different yogic system, and it all seems to be heading in the same direction. I don't know. Can you clear it up for me, or what? What is the best means, or what is the best yoga tool that we can adapt? I would say uh, it will be karma yoga, you know. Uh, why I would say karma yoga is because it is acting, uh, I mean, we are working, but then uh, we, are not de uh, we are not attached to the results because we are uh, offering the results to, you know, uh, Krishna. Mm -hmm. So I would say karma yoga is the highest form of yoga, you know. And uh, when it's done for uh, Krishna, so I would consider this as the highest form. And even uh, you can see that there's partly karma yoga uh, is also in bhakti yoga. When we do the service for Krishna and act for Krishna, then this karma is is done on behalf of Krishna. So I would consider this as the highest form of yoga.
हरे कृष्ण प्रभु जी बट आई थिंक as a uh, gyan yogi is also connected to bhakti so we can also consider that also because in that we get knowledge about krishna that is a transcendental one the spiritual knowledge is permanent and it goes with us life after life and in the material knowledge which we gain in this world is a just a temporary one uh, it will not use in our next life so uh, this knowledge of krishna by reading scriptures and by hearing about lord krishna we gain is a gyan yoga is also part of bhakti yoga so we can con- also consider that one also this is my views on this yeah hari krishna prabhu and then i would like to say about dhyan yoga according to bhagavad gita to practice dhyan yoga or ashtanga yoga kind of sort thing uh, one has to go to secure place and should lay kusha grass and then it there are so many uh, measurements one should not sit too high or too low and it's very impossible to control the mind in one sense and is is also mentioned like when someone is leaving the body uh, while practicing the dhyan yoga there are particular timings also if and that timings actually misses in seconds in milliseconds even and they will uh, either they will leave in the settled bodies or they will come back again and there is always challenging in dhyana yoga but when it's compared compared to krishna consciousness in dhyana yoga uh, senses are always nicely engaged for example um, meditation and there is no such thing much better than chanting hare krishna mantra and that would be the best meditation instead of like meditating on some impersonal uh, brahman or uh, 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 nothing and then uh, uh, for example i used to have a habit of like you know whenever we go out in a especially in western country it is you know it's very difficult to control the eyes you know when we see especially uh, beautiful women uh, beautiful things and then in my case actually uh, rather i was uh, involved in the dt worship a dt service department so then i i really enjoy like uh, decorating the dts and it was rather london show in london so uh, and that was the and also we were told like these dts are profile very favorite dts and that gave me personally so much attachment and i started getting attachment to uh, krishna by look i engaging my eyes and then uh, for the senses another uh, senses uh, and glorify the devotees and glorify the lord and that that was a kind of engagement um, then uh, eating the instead of eating uh, unnecessary food and then it's better to eat prasadam and this is also one of the sense con- uh, sense control thing and in my case actually i started going to temple many years back like only for the prasadam sake and, and slowly slowly i was captivated by the secret behind prasadam so these are all um, things in krishna consciousness in dhyana yoga is much better than practicing the um, general dhyana yoga and which is has no guarantee but uh, as krishna said like you know dhyana yoga in krishna consciousness always has the eternal asset and this is a permanent it will not be uh, uh, deviated from our uh, our consciousness so this is what i would like to conclude maharaj okay thank you prabhu so we will just finish it maharaj um kusha kriyani maharaj ji what is the conclusion of all of this um looks like the yoga has all the components of other yoga systems so you know i think it's better to just jump into bhakti yoga and perform than going you know and trying to find some highest form in other ways How, how do you jump into it um uh, well i don't know maharaj but just <laughs> join with the devotees try to act it you know just follow the example of the senior devotees i mean that's the best way to jump in i think and and i try to practice i mean i i think it's not easy to jump in like you said earlier a lot of devotees are also not really situated in bhakti yoga although we feel like we are doing bhakti yoga we're actually acting in karma yoga because we're not able to give our full time to krishna consciousness but as much as possible just um try to remember krishna chant his names and any work any activity you do just think about you know think of it as a service that's how i feel you can jump into it but i still don't know figuring out much <laughs> 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 okay, thank you very much. All right. So we'll go ahead. We've got one more group. Group number 
one, is it? Group two, Maharaj. Group two, sorry. Group two. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Maharaj. Uh, uh, in, in, in group two, we have uh, myself, Babbay Mahajan, uh, Arjuna Mataji, and Jivan. Uh, we will do a role play. And during role play, we will kind of uh, uh, do the, I will play the role of Karma Yogi. Uh, Arjuna Mataji will play a role of Jnana Yogi. And uh, Jivan Babu will play a role of Bhakti Yogi. And uh, we will put up put forward some uh, some arguments why why the individual uh, yoga is better uh, but uh, the job Prabhu will cut all the arguments in the end and put the conclusion properly so just forgive us if we uh, put the <laughs> arguments in favor of one uh, the karma yoga and then okay so, so starting from karma yoga uh Jivan Prabhu i think uh, you know karma yogis are, are better because at least they work they are more productive, and uh, and obviously uh, that is the most uh, tangible form of uh, uh, yoga because you you work and you produce and uh, you this work is the worship. So that way you concentrate on karma, be productive, be fruitful to other societies, uh, the other society members, and uh, you know don't just sit and just. Uh, you know, do your own own stuff. So I, so, I, so, I, so, I, so I think karma yogis are better and have higher chances of success. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dhanat Pranams, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. I'm too insignificant, first of all, to speak about it, but please kindly accept my respectful obeisances on this. So, uh, Abhay Mahajan Prabhu on the your point, karma yogi. The thing is, if I, uh, it is about you're doing your work, you're doing your karma. But the thing is, it is obviously uh, bound to this material world. You'll be still, because you're doing it for somewhere or the other, there is a personal sense gratification. So you'll be bound to this material universe. The point is to go back, go back home to God. So when you're doing karma yogi, or you're uh, bound to karma, that is, you know, bound to this material world, you're actually going to stay over here. The Janma Mrityu Jara Vyadi. These are the four material miseries that will be still, you know, you'll be encircled. You'll be in that, uh, you know, loop all the time. So you won't be able to get out of this. And that is not... No, I, will take, I will execute my yoga perfectly and I will go back to all, all uh, you know, all white Brahma yoga. Okay, so that is my hope. I will go back to that. That is that is there, Prabhu, but people also come back from the Brahma Jyoti. It is, it is like an example we put it in this way. It is like a maze. It is like a maze. You're just running around to try to find the proper route. But, you know, you're simply running around. You, uh, when you, you're not able to get the proper route, get out. You'll be simply running around. Like, there's there's no target. Oh, you... So, I can fall back from Brahma Jyoti again to material world? Yes, oh, yes I didn't know that. And you, you, can, you can absolutely fall back. But the point here is to actually realize and uh, you know make your connection with the supreme personality of God, supreme person, the absolute proprietor. You are you are here to serve Him to go back to God. And I will not come back, fall fall back if I serve directly to Krishna. Yes, Krishna guarantees uh, himself. If if you you know it is like you take a step towards Krishna, He takes thousand steps towards you. So if you if you want to go back to him and you achieve that, you're never coming back here. Yeah, you sold me Bhakti Yoga Prabhu. Thanks a lot. I got. Yes. Hi Krishna Mataji. Okay. Hi Krishna. So I am the Gyani Yogi. Yes, Mataji. So I am I am uh, happy with my knowledge, so because I am better than uh, Karma Yogi and Karma Khanda, so I have a knowledge of Brahman, and uh, so I think what I'm doing is good already, and I'm confident with this that I have a better knowledge of uh, the Brahman that light. That Paramatma, not yet Paramatma. Yeah. So. Yes, yes, Madam. Any advice? Uh, for knowledge, knowledge should. Uh, it is. It is good to have knowledge, Madam. 
you're you're right means you're taking the step forward but knowledge should always be used for uh, the welfare of the others to you know uh, to liberate the conditioned souls so having knowledge obviously bhakti yoga has uh, the complete knowledge the, the, the greatest knowledge is shrimad bhagavatam and you know uh, and chaitanya charitamrita all bro shil prabhupada's books the you know all our acharyas have taken so much effort and pain to put out this knowledge right from uh, shilaveda vyas so the whole point of knowledge is to realize and make your connection with the supreme lord and to get to know who he, who he really is because there's this personal realization that i do have <clears throat> it is like for example mataji if you're supposed to meet a devotee okay you're supposed to meet a devotee at the temple and uh, you know that devotee is waiting for you and somewhere or the other you're, you're a bit you're a little late you're a little late and you're calling him and again and again you're calling the devotee and again and again and saying prabhu mataji i'm really sorry i'm really late i'm running uh, you know a little late on time but just imagine just imagine that krishna bring a friend he's right there in goloka and uh, you know he's been waiting for how many lifetimes he he cares about everyone each and every individual soul so you can just imagine how much you know how much he's waiting for us to come back though i'm too insignificant to speak about this but though he's he's, he's still waiting and he's still, he's still doesn't force he's like you enjoy your time you do, you do whatever you want once you realize the parts you come back that is okay so having knowledge is good but you should always you know try to apply that knowledge in the right way in the right form to understand what is important and get up you know the gold right that is going back to god okay bruji understood all right krishna mataji thank you thank you mataji okay any other is that it prabhu yes my that that is it actually we didn't really plan properly uh huh Okay, thank you very much. So nice to see your understanding of the uh, situation. Let's see. Let's go back. Okay. So Prabhupada explains to us the the power of bhakti. Direct process. Factually, bhakti yoga is the ultimate goal but to analyze bhakti yoga minutely one has to understand these other yogas from the purport of the final verse chapter 6 text 47 so it certainly a big help for us to understand generally we don't think about these other yogas until we start reading this section of the bhagavad gita and we understand how important prabhupad mentions about it how we have to understand these other yogas so if someone says why shall i take advantage of this elevator i shall go step by step he can go but there is chance if you take this bhakti yoga immediately you take the help of the elevator and within a second you are on the 100th floor direct process bhagavad gita lecture chapter 6 46 and 47 los angeles okay 1969 here's the final verse yoginam api sarvesham madgatin antaratmana shradavan bachate yomam samayuta tamo mataha and of all yogis the one who with great faith who always abides in me thinks of me within himself and renders transcendental loving service to me he is the most intimately united with me in yoga and is the highest of all that is my opinion so arjuna yoga was fighting prabhupada explains If one is fortunate enough to come to the point of bhakti yoga it is to be understood that he has surpassed 
all other yogas. Therefore, to become Krishna conscious is the highest stage of yoga. Just as when we speak of Himalaya, we refer to the world's highest mountains, of which the highest peak, Mount Everest, is considered to be the culmination. So Prabhupada is comparing the yoga system to the Himalayas and Bhakti Yoga to Mount Everest. From the purport. Okay, then just to cover what we've looked at today, understanding, we looked over the sections of these chapters, 4, 5 and 6. We talked about Bhagavad Gita 33 to 34 and 10 to 14, about how impractical the Ashtanga Yoga is for the modern age. And we heard also how Bhakti Yoga can be practiced without having practiced. Yeah, this, uh, uh, we didn't really cover this, but it's there, certainly, in Prabhupada's lectures and sometimes in the purport, that you, we don't have to practice these other yoga systems, because if we're practicing Bhakti Yoga properly, then it includes Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga and Dhyana Yoga. It's not that we have to practice first Karma Yoga and then Jnana Yoga and then, Jnana, and then come to Bhakti Yoga. We can immediately begin Bhakti Yoga and all the parts, all the components are there without having practiced these other things. Just by doing Bhakti Yoga, we automatically develop detachment from the material existence because we become Krishna conscious and we automatically develop knowledge about Krishna and his energies because we read the books and we go to classes and we're also meditating because we're seeing the deities and we're also chanting the holy name. So all of the yoga systems are all there within Bhakti Yoga. Final quote from Prabhupada directly bhakti yoga. Krishna consciousness means from the very beginning directly bhakti yoga. Just like we have given many times the example, there is a staircase, you have to go to the highest floor, which is say 100th floor. So somebody is on the 50th floor. Somebody is on the 30th floor. Somebody is on the 80th floor. So if by coming to the particular floor one thinks this is finished, then he is not progressing. One has to go to the end. The whole staircase can be called a yoga system, connecting link, but don't be satisfied by keeping yourself on the 50th floor or 80th floor. Go to the highest platform, the 100th or 150th floor, that is Bhakti Yoga. Lecture in Los Angeles, 6th chapter, 46 and 47. Jai, Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Okay, any final questions from the devotees? Anything? Yes, Gurudev, may I? Yes, please. Uh, uh, my question is, like uh, we say that bhakti yoga, bhakti process that we do, there is no loss. Even we are not successful in this life, next life we continue from that percentage that we did. How about other yoga process, Guru Maharaj? Do they also get to continue or if they take birth again, then they have to start all over again? Yes, of course, whatever they've done in this life, uh, 
it will influence their next life, the consciousness, because the consciousness of their activities. They've done yoga, they're doing some yoga in this life. It may, may not be bhakti yoga, but they're doing some yoga in this life. So it's going to influence their state of mind and their consciousness at the time of death. And it will determine what kind of situation they will take. Now in the Bhagavad Gita, we didn't discuss it, but it, it's there in one of the sections. Arjuna asks that what happens if I take to this process and I'm not successful? So then Lord Krishna described two situations. One is you practice for a short time and the other is you practice for a long time but some still how not successful. So, you practice for a short time, you will go to higher planets. And you, because, because you've only practiced yoga for a short time, so you still have a lot of material desires. You have a, a many desires for sense gratification. So Lord Krishna arranges that you go to the higher planets, and you satisfy all your material desires there in the heavenly planets. And when you're tired of sense gratification, then you come back to earth. And then when you, when you come back to earth, you take birth in, a, in an aristocratic or wealthy family. And then you have the opportunity to take up the yoga again. So they may not have done bhakti yoga, they may have done some other kind of yoga, so it will depend on the level of their advancement, what will happen. Now if they've made a lot of advancement, but still somehow not fully successful, then they will take the next birth in a family of devotees. So the children born in devotee families are very special. It's understood that previously there were advanced yogis. They were trying, they were practicing yoga and made a lot of progress but not fully successful. So they take birth in a devotee family and then from the beginning of their life they have the opportunity to progress. So somebody is doing karma yoga or jnana yoga, they will get the benefit. They will, they will get benefit, it's going to influence their state of mind, consciousness, and the next life they'll have the opportunity to continue. But to take up bhakti, there has to be the contact with the devotee. They have to get the mercy of a devotee before they can come. They're not going to get free of birth and death just by doing for example, karmakanda activities. Karmakanda activities can't take you out of the material world. Karma yogi can come, they can go to the Brahma Jyoti. They may be in person, but other karma yogis can also become devotees. So the karma yogi can become a devotee and he can go back to Godhead. Or he, he may, if, see if somebody is doing karma yoga, then he may attract the association of a devotee. And the devotee sees that he, oh, he's doing karma yoga, we should try to bring him to Krishna consciousness. Why just let him be an impersonalist? Why just let him do only karma yoga? Let him become a bhakti yogi. Let him do devotion. So somebody's more pious and more, more uh, sincere in their practice of yoga, they will attract the attention of a devotee and a devotee will want to give them mercy. Right? We see, oh, he's, he's doing nice yoga, I should give him some prasadam or let him hear the holy name, tell him about Krishna, give him a chance to become devotee like that. In, in, in the other yoga processes, you see, they also have to have some bhakti. They have a little bhakti. It has to be there. 
within karma yoga, within jnana yoga, dhyana yoga, there has to be some bhakti. But it's not much. It's more, the emphasis is more on work, or the emphasis is more on knowledge. But there's always a little bit of bhakti there. Because that's why they're practicing yoga. They have to have some bhakti. But we're saying, make it pure bhakti. Don't be attached to the work or to the knowledge. Be attached to Krishna. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions? Okay, so we'll meet next week. So thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada ki. Gorbhakta Vrinda ki. Hare Krishna.